This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org. Slash give. For more, we're joined by Kumi Naidu, longtime South African human rights and environmental justice activist, former head of Greenpeace International, also former head of Amnesty International, now the president of the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty Initiative. Can you lay out what this Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty is all about and what you're doing, Kumi? So, the first time I met you, Amy, was at the Copenhagen Climate Summit in 2009, where you'll remember we were calling for a fab deal, not a fabulous deal, but a fair, ambitious and binding deal in 2009. What we got was a flab deal full of loopholes and BS. And what we have seen is important, though the COP is, to get us in the right direction, that when you have the kind of domination by fossil fuel lobbyists and so on in the COP, where they've managed to somehow keep the term fossil fuels off any COP declaration and so on. We have to now recognize that we need something uh, complementary. And I think the effort made by Sapora Berman, the founder of the treaty, and the the wonderful team that she's assembled is exactly what we need, which is we need to have a legal instrument that ensures that governments can comply. Right now, it's sort of voluntary, right? They can agree things in COP and they can walk away on it the next day. So we are starting a process. Uh, there's already 13 countries on board. The exciting thing is already Colombia and Timor-Leste, two fossil fuel exporting countries are already on board. And we feel quite confident that has more and more extreme weather events happen on a day-to-day -day basis virtually around the world, that citizens are rising in a way that we will push our leaders to actually come together and get a global agreement to phase out completely and eradicate fossil fuels from our economic system. And Kumi, uh, you mentioned Colombia. Could you talk about what is going on in terms of movements in Latin America, the Colombia becoming the first nation to, uh, to join the, uh, uh, the coalition? So uh, what we are seeing is that the most vulnerable countries in the world and those that are in the front line of climate impacts are the ones that actually are the first movers. And basically, once we have a critical mass, we can start the conversations towards the content of the treaty. Just to be clear to all governments, the treaty does not exist. This is about creating a process that will give us the uh, 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 binding outcome where hopefully we can hold our leaders account. So with the Colombia, we applaud their leadership and we hope that other fossil fuel producing countries in the global south will also see that it's in their long term interest not to continue their addiction to a poison, which is oil, coal and gas that is killing our children and their children's futures. And could you name names, talk about some of the nations and corporations that are profiting the most from fossil fuel extraction now, even while their words may say something differently? Oh, the, that list, sadly, one is, is very long. Uh, so let me just say that there's double speak here, right? Because the, the, the thing is, we have won the argument, and we won the argument several years ago in the sense that not a single nation in the world says that the climate science is not urgent and real. Not a single fossil fuel company in the world denies the climate science has they were doing in the past and putting a lot of um, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in lies and misinformation confusing people. Where the big dif difference is about the pace of the phase out. Fossil fuel companies and some of the governments that they dominate would like to drag it out, it would seem, right till the end of the century when the science says we are running out of time and we need to do it now. So the fight is for the urgency and the fastest withdrawal. And uh, of course, uh, the most powerful nations in the world, Russia, China, United States, and so on, say one thing about the urgency, but in actual practice are actually nowhere near what the science tells us we need to do. Kumi Naidu, um, in a press briefing yesterday, you compare the fossil fuel industry with the industry of slavery. Explain. So firstly, both industries were legal, right? The fossil fuel industry is legal. The slave industry was legal. 
Secondly, both are absolutely morally impugnant, repugnant, right? The, uh, slavery was one of the worst atrocities committed by human beings on human beings. Fossil fuel addiction, its impact threatens the very existence of our children's future. So the scale of the immorality of our dependence on oil, coal, and gas when we have alternatives and we can move decisively over the next decades to get off it. Uh, but the commonality is also that they have exceptional arrogance, they have exceptional uh, both industries, they have exceptional control over political decision makers in several countries, and both industries behave with absolute impunity. You, do you know that as we sit here today, slave owners in the UK still get compensation, their families still get compensation for the loss of their slaves, right? No compensation to the people under slavery, who, who suffered under slavery. So bottom line is both the industries uh, are immoral, unethical and so on. And we need to start treating the CEOs of fossil fuel companies as slave owners with the same kind of uh, resistance that we saw to bring an end to slavery. Um, the COP, the UN Climate Summit, will be in Baku, Azerbaijan, yet another petro state. Last year, it was the UAE. Um, can you talk about the significance of this and also talk about the role of the United States? We're in a historic election year. What difference what the U.S. does um, makes? So, firstly, you know, if the COP, which you and I have been to multiple times, didn't exist, we would have to create it. But let's be very clear that it's not the best, most equitable, most inclusive negotiating forum. One of the reasons we have had the term fossil fuels, which is the most uh, direct impact on climate change, the most devastating impact kept off the agenda, is because consistently the largest delegations to the COPs is actually the fossil fuel industry. So if you take Glasgow, for example, UK, because it was in the UK, at about 300 delegates. When you combine the fossil fuel uh, lobbyists, they are about 5,000. I mean, just try to imagine that. That is like Alcoholics Anonymous, an organization that does immensely good work and supports people around the world, having their national conference, and the largest delegation to that conference is the alcohol industry. Right? The absurdity of it uh, must be addressed. So then when you ask about the US, obviously in the US, we've got a stark choice. You got the Republican Party, which basically continue, in fact, it's about the only political party I know in the world right now that actually denies the science and whose leader actually, uh, obvi you know, in a blatant way says, we're going to drive fossil fuel production, drill, baby, drill. Uh, so I guess it's not to say that the Democrats are anywhere near what we need them to be, because they say the right things, but we still see they are open to fossil fuel infrastructure being built and so on. So from an activism point of view, whoever gets elected, uh, obviously the Democrats would be a easier fight for us, because uh, while they're not where we need them to be, they are much closer to what we actually need um, from our politicians right now. We only have, like, 30 seconds, but we just played a clip of, of uh, Greta Thunberg, um, who was making the link between uh, Chevron and uh, Gaza. Uh, when she was just a climate activist—I won't say just a, a just climate activist—she was covered all over the world and in the United States. In the United States, you almost never see her now talking about Gaza. You're a South African. South Africa has brought that case to the International Court of Justice of genocide against Israel. Your quick comments linking the anti-war movement and the climate justice movement. We have to recognize many of the struggles we face are very intersecting and very connected. The fact that Greta and other voices who see no contradiction between standing up against genocide on the one end and standing up uh, for an ecocide uh, that we are experiencing as a result of climate change. There shouldn't be a contradiction between the two. And uh, it is sad that, in fact, the media environment, which in the United States, for example, claims to be democratic and open and so on, engages in such censorship 
around the contradictions that we exist. Because, you know, occupation in Ukraine is completely accepted. Occupation in Palestine is treated in completely different ways by the media, and that should change. Kumi Naidu, South African human rights and environmental justice activist, president of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.